thing it's doing is recording my entire screen. Doing, so hence why I have my picture up here too. So there's, I'm going to flip back and forth between me so that you can watch me and know that I'm actually really not here there, whatever it is uh, in that weird sort of um, schizophrenia of electronic communication and video. Anyway, so I, and I will just put this up online as well so, you, uh, so that you can review. So to check out the schedule of where we are, right, you know that on Wednesday you've got an exam, exam number two in your breakout section rather everybody has an exam the next class period in his or her breakout section. And uh, it is covering French New Wave, which I'm going to go over to today, over today. And I need to work kind of right into that. So we don't have the opening section right now where I generally ask you about the class. If you've got something specific that you're ready to come in here and say, please stay after and let's, I want to hear about it. But I'm going to have to jump right into content at, the, uh, at this time. Um, all right, even that. Is there anything opening anyone felt like they absolutely had to say? Good. All right, then we're good. You ever have one of those weekends where you get just energized, right? And you know how much you look forward to ener uh, weekends regularly, right? Today's Monday and you're already looking forward to the weekend. I had one of those weekends, and so now I'm ready to go with today. So let's take a look at uh, where, where we are in terms of our timeline development, where this week fits in with other weeks, so that we are continuously reminded of this, the overall story that we set out on the first day of class. So if you don't recall on that first day of class, I very much introduced the class, and what I would do is to tell you a story all semester long. And so I've always tried to come back to that. So whenever I refer back to like a broad generic timeline and that sort of that sort of thing, I'm trying to make sure that it fits in for you in some way in terms of the overall story of international cinema development that, I, that we're trying to learn about, engage, and then in a real way also use uh, in, in the world. And, and on Twitter feed, I regularly see uh, people tweeting things about how they recognize something from this class in, out in the world. I'm very appreciative of that. Uh, by the way, um, let's today, if you want to tweet your notes, since we've got an exam coming up, let's do, what did I say uh, to do? I can already show you. I've already got the uh, Twitter uh, timeline thing set up here. Uh, the Waltons. I do that for my daughter, who's a fan of the Waltons. Uh, yeah, so 2700 FNW is the way I'd like us all to tweet. I already tweeted that out this morning. So uh, we will take, we'll come back and take a look at that in just a moment. So what is it, 2700, if you're interested, French New Wave, why it's FNW. All right. So in terms of that story, right, we just ended last, or we discussed last week Italian, uh, Italian neorealism. We kind of put that into the timeline that we're talking about. And, the, and one of the ways we could talk about Italian neorealism is that it, 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 it is caused in a very real way by World War II, right? So much stuff is caused in the middle of the 20th century by the rupture that World War II is, that how severe a, a historical event and a person event, right? That it involved humans doing things to other humans that are unimaginable in any other context. So severely rupturing is that in the 20th century that French, uh, Italian neorealism could be seen as coming out of that rupture, as I said in those notes, coming out of that just devastation and the despair at that moment. So it was specifically tied to a cultural, historical, political, geopolitical moment, right? And then Hollywood cinema and the story that we've been telling in no small part has been distanced and disconnected in some way from that real world aspects. That those stories and bringing up Baby and His Girl Friday, Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, are not intimately connected to the real world. Well, I might have made an argument about Casablanca, a film that begins on a map of Europe showing the move of fascism throughout Europe and the people who are trying to escape to the city of Casablanca. But very early in that movie, it shifts its focus from that historical moment onto a story that you and I all remember about it. It's about love. That you might remember Casablanca because it's, as people say, the greatest love story ever told. Whatever, but it begins on an ideologically, the ideologically weighty moment of World War II. And so French New Wave, what I'm going to start talking about today, and by the way, it should, as someone thoughtfully pointed out to me in an email, that should say chapter 12, not 13. It's correct on the day-by-day -day syllabus, and it's correct in your book as well. To just show you, by the way, if you've never actually seen it, that's your book. Just to let you know, 
right? But this is the book, and I am in chapter 12 right now, talking about New Wave. I'll come back to that stuff. Uh, I'll come back to that stuff in just a moment. And let me get that up there as well. Right, so the French New Wave is going to, like French, uh, like Italian neorealism before, it is going to be significantly affected by World War II. And as we're going to see, Hollywood is affected, in, or as we saw, Hollywood's affected in certain ways, but not in the rupturous sort of way immediately that Italian neorealist cinema, or as we'll be discussing today with French New Wave. So again, we're kind of tweeting our notes to this. In French New Wave, we're roughly talking about the mid-1950s uh, to uh, something like the 1970s, earliest 1970s, just to give you a time period. So you can see it's delayed from World War II, that it's immediate, the immediate effects of Italian neorealism are not felt immediately in French cinema. And so here begins the story and the historical ways in which it connects. That is, after World War II, if you don't notice, in France, France was occupied by Germany during World War II. That as Hitler's machine was moving east and westward, north and southward, remember we told a little bit about that story into, into Italy. So Germany armed militarily moves south towards Italy. And as it moves westward towards France, actually they touch, right? Uh, as it tries to go into France, France kind of goes, oh, white flag, surrender, kind of come in sort of thing. Again, I might, I'm definitely overstating it. But generally speaking, we can see that France kind of says, no, don't kick the doors in, let us let you in. And rather than hooking up their already, their presidential or their um, political system, remember Mussolini kind of holds hands with Hitler for a little while and agrees with him and that sort of thing. But in France, the government just says, no, 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 why don't you just be our government from Berlin? So we have what in histor history is called Vichy, the, the Vichy Soir government. And indeed, at the end of Casablanca, when uh, we'll always have Paris, and all these other statements are made. Um, what is, what's the big line from the end of Casablanca? We'll always have Paris? Is that the end where they kiss goodbye and then she gets on the airplane and flies away? After, he fly, after she, Ilsa, flies away, some other French guy, a, a French guy comes up to him and asks him for a bottle of water. It says Vichy water on it, and he throws it on the ground. That is. France was ruled by Berlin, right? So rather than kind of getting together with the government, like the dictatorship in, Fr in Italy, here we have the government in France really just a puppet government from Berlin, right? That Berlin controls what's going on there. So if we think about France as having been occupied militarily and government-wise as well. And so Italy responds in one way to the aftermath of World War II. Well, coming out of World War II in France is a really weird thing that French people don't know exactly how you're supposed to move out of this time period, how you're going to move from a complicitous fascist ruling, that is, they allowed Hitler to kind of rule them. They don't know how to move out of that. And if you know anything about French history, you might know that Charles de Gaulle, the guy after whom the air, one of the three airports in Paris is named, was the president before World War II, then a guy named Patton was the president during World War II. De Gaulle runs again after World War II. And so when a president that was controlling France, or well, leading France, leading into that um, puppet Vichy government, wants to run afterwards, he makes the statement that we might have heard about France before, Viva la France, long live France, is his campaign slogan, as you hopefully are, have already voted or are going to vote tomorrow. That was the campaign slogan that de Gaulle ran on after World War II. Long live France, look at our glorious history, let's return to that notion of history. And for a whole bunch of people, that history rang very, very hollow. Right? That for a number, particularly of youth and much younger generation, looking back at the glory of France led directly to the fascist, fascism that had occupied France for the past five or seven years. So they were very wary of that idea. And those, so those people who were born during the war and come of age during World War II are very resistant about that idea of some romantic past that existed that we could return to, some glory days of France. And these are the people we're going to meet today. That the two, only two people we're going to talk about, uh, Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard, I could probably blow that up just a little bit for us, that Francois Truffaut and Jean-Luc Godard are born during this time period and are going to start making their first movies roughly in 1959, that's the beginning of this time period, and they're going to be infused with a thought about the new, about change, not the Viva la France, long live that glorious history of France, 
as if that history really existed, they would say, but yet something radical and new. So the title of this chapter 12, again, it's not 13, but 12 here, is the French New Wave, a radical shift in terms of filmmaking style and story. Not going back to the way things were made in French, uh, in French films before the war, but doing something radical and fresh and new. In two weeks, I think, we will talk about new Hollywood cinema that's going to be roughly 1967 time period, starting and then continuing up until maybe the release of Star Wars in 1977, when Hollywood finally is going to make a shift, change from three or four decades of the dominant mode we've been talking about. Well, here France is going to shift radically in terms of their uh, filmmaking, both in terms of the story, the content, but also the narrative, how that stuff is put together. That in large part, what we could say is that French cinema is going to reject what Hollywood has done and what French cinema had previously done. And one of the things we could say about classical Hollywood cinema was that it was perfection. Whether or not you liked it, that doesn't matter. We're not talking about judgment in terms of perf uh, perfection in terms of judgment, but that every edit and line of dialogue and lighting element and blocking of characters and all of those things that go into mise-en-scene, cinematography, editing, and sound production are perfectly manicured. They are perfectly put in place so that, in a, as we said, they disappear, so that you focus only on the story. And these French New Wave folks are going to reject that, these perfect camera angles. <laughs> Remember what we said about classical Hollywood cinema is that the camera was always looking at exactly what it needed to be looking at at every single moment, eyeline shots. Motivated edits. What's that over there? Cut. We cut to that thing. It fulfills the audience's expectation in that way. And French New Wave say they reject that because what that does is hide the camera. It hides the editing, that invisible style. Hides the camera's placement. Uh, 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 pardon me. It's, uh, yeah, it's position in the frame. It hides the cinematic elements. It hides the edit. It hides all of that so that all you see and all you hear is story. And for them, they don't get that. that they, what they want to do is to raise the camera maybe even beyond the notion of story. That let's not focus on story, but on showing. Right? Using the camera and editing and all of those elements of cinema in order to foreground those things. So when watching the clips that we're going to watch today from 400 Blows, this film, and then in just a moment, um, uh, Breathless by Jean-Luc Godard, you will very much see the camera, see the edits, hear the sound. You will not be sutured into the film. You will, indeed, some of this stuff is kind of almost anti-suture in that way. So these guys are born roughly in the late 30s to the early 1940s time period, roughly. So they're coming of age, well now they're young during World War II, and coming of age in the immediate post-World War II years. And through the 1950s, a couple of these guys get hooked up together. There are a whole bunch of people associated with the French New Wave, but again, we're only going to talk about Truffaut in just a moment, and then Jean-Luc Godard. But a couple of them hook up by hanging out in film clubs together, going to the movies on a regular basis and talking about those movies not just did you like that, but talk about ideological and political and historical content that's in, that are in those films. So really investigating them. And so what they came to appreciate were films that made you ask questions, that made you engage them rather than watch them. Remember, Hollywood through its perfection in that way, and even classical French cinema as well. They uh, they showed you very clearly the story. So at the end of the movie, a sense of catharsis. I got it. I know what that story is about. Whereas the French New Wave very much wanted to reject that. So they can, regardless, they were hanging out in these film clubs. That's the sort of film that interested them. Talking about those films in what we might call a critical, invested to give manner, rather than just one that says thumbs up or thumbs down, evaluation sort of manner. And they start writing for a film journal. So at the top in italics, it says Cahier du Cinema. And in French, that's, that's kind of straight translated as film notebooks, cinema notebooks. But Cahier du Cinema refers to a journal that during the 1940s and 1950s, uh, someone starts that is about the critical investigation and analysis of film. So rather than a pop sort of publication that deals with fancy pictures and appreciation of film and that sort of thing, it is a place where people start writing. So in Cahiers, in that journal devoted to that film scholar, some 
late teenagers and late, early 20s, guys in their late teens, early 20s, guys like Truffaut and Godard and Claude Chabrol and a whole bunch of, 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 of other folks, including, by the way, a woman named Anya Svarda, who was just here last semester, uh, and we had her at the Rialto and showed her brand her latest film, The Beaches of Agnes, uh, and, and, and got a long-term discussion. We've got, I invited you on a date, if you didn't know this, on Twitter, right, to go uh, to see someone, Renee Claire, I think it is. Is that who's going to be at Emory? Right? I said, anybody want to go and hang out over at Emory for one of these things? Uh, and I got some responses on that, right? She's still alive. She still makes movies. She's going to be over at Emory next week. And she's like 80 years old. And she'll just talk to us about this time period and accept and all of the notion of her engagement with French history. Well, these guys show uh, uh, Truffaut and then Jean-Louis Godard hanging out in these film clubs, get to know each other, writing about film for a journal, Cahiers du Cinema. Um, and, but they're not filmmakers, right? That they don't come to their making of their first films. Both of these guys, Truffaut and Godard, are going to release their first film, more or less their first film, in the same year and submit them to submit it to the Cannes Film Festival. And Truffaut is going to win the Mac Daddy Prize, and Godard is going to win another. A high level prize in the con, uh, in the con film festival for their vet more or less their very first films their first feature length films well but they're writing for Kaye de cinema and there's another group which Anya Svarda would be a part called the left bank group like if you have any mythical fantasies about what France uh, Paris is necessarily like you might have thought about people walking around in berets and smoking goulois cigarettes and reading Flaubert or something like that, maybe just doodling while sitting by the Seine River, right, the river that goes right through from, uh, Paris. And those guys would always be hanging out on the left bank, right? That's the left bank, arty, philosophical, thoughtful, academic side, as they say, of the, of German, uh, of German, where? Uh, of Paris, of the Seine River. And so there's another group that's associated with that artsy, philosophical history. But these guys come straight from film. But straight, you know, Truffaut and Godard, come straight from thinking about film when they come to make their first projects. Uh, 400 Blows and uh, Breathless, as we'll see in just a moment. So when I suggest that they deride French cinema, classical French cinema, I'm also including, frankly, uh, Hollywood cinema as well that what they were watching through the late 1940s and into the 1950s, and these guys were going to the movies sometimes together every day and talking about them at length, they, when they go to um, make these, uh, when they go to watch these movies, many of them are not subtitled. And what they're watching are Hollywood, significantly are Hollywood movies that for the past seven years did not, were not shown in France because France was occupied by Germany. Why would Germany let the enemy's films into the country? They would never have done that. So there's this whole backup. Remember, Hollywood is pumping out the movies in the late, uh, early 1940s. So there's a lot of movie history to catch, Hollywood movie history to catch up on. They're watching these movies sometimes not without, pardon me, sometimes without subtitles. So they're having to pay attention to the style. They're having to pay attention to editing because they can't always get the words. They're paying attention to how the camera tells a story. So when they come to their filmmaking and their criticism, that's how they approach it. When they're writing in the journal, Cahiers de Cinema, which is now at the very top here, uh, they're, writing about, uh, they're writing about it in a critical manner. So in rejecting both the perfection, so where it says the manner compositions, that means the perfect, it's polished so unbelievably well. That's indeed what we said about Hollywood's invisible style, that it's so polished that you don't even see it. It's like your windshield of your car. Right? You don't ever see it. You hopefully, right? The bird, whatever, right? You sometimes see it, but the windshield ought to be invisible to you, and that's the way classical Hollywood works. Hide the style and just pay attention to the story. They didn't like that, as I suggest here. They derided that. They put, they looked down on that. And as well, they looked down on cinema that relied heavily upon editing in order to tell the story. That cinema, like classical Hollywood, in which a character goes, "What's that over there?" Cut, edit to the thing, montage the thing, so that you look and the audience always knows where he or she is and what he or she's supposed to be looking at because the camera shows it. So they have kind of thumbs down on that, right? Reliant, heavily reliance upon montage. In the moment, we're not gonna watch Shoot the Piano Player, by the way. Uh, in 400 Blows, that most of the uh, very, very long takes will be used in the telling of this real time, not edited time. 
show the event, play it out, let's just watch it happen, rather than that is, let's favor mise-en-scene over editing, a heavy reliance upon editing for clear storytelling. So very quickly, and I don't need to go too depth about the individual um, stylistic <coughs> markers of French New Wave, but now, with technologically, the camera has shrunk, and someone can just hold it, rather than have to have a harness or roll it. So you can have a handheld camera for the first time that camera technology shrunk a significant amount during World War II because of documentary and news type of people wanted to be able to have access to world, the war. And you can't go on the battlefield. This is why World War I video looks so vastly different from video, documentary video from World War II. Because now we can be on the ground running with the troops. In World War I, we stand and we watch the troops. The camera's not moving in through it. But in World War II, we had had these handheld cameras. Well, they, the French New Wave folks, liked that idea. Hollywood would never have had, back in this time period, a handheld camera. Why would classical Hollywood in visible style not have a handheld camera? Why would they not? Yeah. You're about, you want to say it? Come on, yeah, that's your question. And then we can present the it distracts from the storyline. Okay, I like that. Well, you were going to say something? Yeah, purple sweater, sure. No. No. Okay, uh, right, so it distracts from the storyline. That is, it would draw attention to itself. Right? That's what I hear you saying there. It's that it would draw attention to itself. The viewer would recognize that there's a camera. That when you're watching that opening scene of bringing a baby, you don't notice there's a camera at all. It's so it's hidden in the edits and in any camera movement that takes place. You remember my story, the made-up scene we had the other day, which the camera saw me come into a restaurant, and I I check in with the host and say, "Oh, I don't, I, I see where I'm going." You remember this scenario? Did I do this in this class? I got enough yeses to believe you missed that. <laughs> All right, so the camera sees me. Remember, the camera's either going to follow me. I motivate the camera movement or it's going to edit to the other place and allow me into it right there. You don't see the camera when you're watching that, if we were to watch that scene. You would not recognize that there was a camera. It looks like reality unfolding in front of you. These guys want to draw attention to the camera. The camera is like the pen for the philosopher or the writer. Right? To see, to read a written word is to see the art. Right? The typed letters or the handwritten letters is to see it. And for these guys, they wanted you to see the camera because it is the pen that tells the story that you're about to watch. Like uh, Italian neorealism as well, they would have shot on location rather than going into a set because the set, going into a studio set, would be where you could be perfect. You could do retake after retake. But if you're on location shooting on the Champs Elysees, the main big fancy boulevard in Paris, if you're out filming on that thing, you can't do retakes because the scene has always changed. Right? If you're really on location and you're not controlling the traffic patterns, both pedestrian and motor vehicle, when you, if you want to retake it, that bus has already gone. Those cars have already, or those pedestrians have already walked by. And so they, you can't control it. So it's unpredictable. They like that. They wanted zest and spontaneity. Is that out there anywhere? Did you want to see that in the notes? That's a phrase that I've used before. They wanted this, a sense of zest and spontaneity to it, spontaneity to, that is covered up in classical Hollywood. Right? That watching Bringing Up Baby, uh, no, let's say watching His Girl Friday when in the, uh, with the killer who's in the roll top desk of the courtroom. You remember this where Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell? Is it Rosalind Russell? Yes, Cary Grant and Rosalind Russell were talking that it's so perfect and so polished that there's nothing spontaneous at all. It's totally manicured. Similarly, they would use natural lighting rather than in a studio where a studio would be shot full of perfect lighting, what we call three-point lighting. If you're on location, just don't even bring your own lights. Use ambient light, whatever already exists there. So it's not going to be perfect. People are going to walk in and out of shadows. You will notice them, that sort of thing. When the first day he comes to make breathless, Jean-Luc Godard has got a 
very little written down. Two pages provided to him by Truffaut, and he has his a, he's got a French man actor, no one knows, and he's got a woman who's a B actor, a B Hollywood actress. That is, she's not been in any dominant, great American movies, but she speaks French. So he brings her to the shop, so he's in, and he goes, okay, Michel, to the dude, you're a gangster, with an ER, uh, and you've, you've, you, you're gonna, what are you, what are you gonna say to her? And they start writing the dialogue right there. Uh, and they say, you're a, you're, a, you're a silly American woman who speaks kind of not such great French, but you think you do. What are you going to say to him? And they start going along, right? Very much improvised in the moment, but also in the film itself, because they improvise that dialogue. Don't, when you're on location uh, and improvising that, just get a microphone and record what you get. Don't control it and polish it in that way. So when walking down the Champs-Élysées, someone's got a camera filming those, that Michelle and Patrice walking down the Champs-Élysées. One's got a camera, another sound guy standing here like this. Oh, what if a bus goes by? Oh, well, the bus went by. You missed that line of dialogue, right? Because that's the way it is in world, right? It's in a way much closer reality directly recording whatever you have out there. And so we might see a scene in, four, uh, in Breathless in which that happens, where characters are talking and then they're about, and then they're talking on the other end of it, and we have no idea what they said when that bus went by. And as I'll see, as we'll see very clearly with Breathless in just a moment, we have perfect examples of a discontinuous elliptical style of editing, we're gonna, uh, or style of edit, that we're going to call the jump cut. So let's check out some clips now from 400 Lows, which by my estimation would definitely go in the top eight films of all time. So let me go ahead and pause our recording. You, if we could not recognize the shaky handheld camera through most of that scene, you did get it when we go outside and everyone else is at recess and some boys are fighting. You do get some shaky handheld there, but now as we come to Jean-Luc Godard's Breathless, you're gonna see um, a significant amount of this shaky handheld camera. As well, you'll see jump cuts, which I'll define. I, I, I hear the question, and I saw it on the Twitter feed already about jump cuts right here, right? And we want to suggest that the, this film has all of the features that we're about to see. And in a real way, what you're going to see even more so for that 400 blows foregrounds that it's almost the effect of an anti-suture, right? If suture is the effect that classical Hollywood's invisible style has on us to weave us into the narrative so that we only are paying attention or we are paying attention to the story only, that's the effect we call suture. Well here, Godard is constantly going to remind us that we're watching a movie. We will see the edits that are disruptive so jump cuts are disruptive. Uh, uh, I don't have it written up here. Jump, jump cuts are disruptive elliptical edits. Right? If you're writing, uh, uh, if you're typing out something, you might put, uh, or if you're tweeting, you might put dot dot dot. Well, that that's called an ellipsis, and that indicates to your reader that you're leaving some stuff out. So in a, if you're writing out a paper, uh, a paper for a class or something, you might you might say Jim said. And then uh, you might quote me for a little bit, but you don't want to quote the whole thing. So you chop some out, you put an ellipsis in the middle, right? And then you keep on writing whatever it is you want to say. When an ellipsis interrupts the flow of what you're writing out and then just joins it to something else. Well, jump cut is an elliptical edit that you will see, and I'll point them out to you and you'll understand exactly what they are. You'll see exactly what they are in just a moment. So Jean-Luc Godard uh, is, uh, is associated with the Cayuga Cinema, that, that film journal devoted to serious film uh, discussions. He's going to be related to that, and he's going to come to make his first film in his early, early 20s, late teens, uh, early 20s time period, and he's going to have a brief scenario, as I've already suggested, written out by Truffaut, but nothing else. He's not going to have a script. He doesn't even know what's going to necessarily happen in the film. And like Truffaut, in large part, he's no experience with a camera at all that he does not know filmmaking in the classical sense in France or in the United States, where you would have been an apprentice for 10 or 20 years before you might ever possibly get the chance to make your own movie. 
that if you wanted to be a director, you had to work with the directors for that 10 or 20 years as an apprentice till you ever got to be an, a, a, the director of photography and then maybe got to be a film, a, 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 the director. Well, here, he's got no experience. He knows what films look like and how they can tell stories, but he doesn't have a real idea of how to operate the camera, much less the editing equipment at all. And so he comes, to make, uh, he comes to make Breathless. If you check this out online, make sure that you don't watch the American remake with Richard Gere. Right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, as, uh, how, uh, find me an American remake of a French movie that is better uh, than the French movie. Did you see, not a French, a European. Just go get a European movie. Did you see uh, Let Me In, a vampire movie? Has anyone ever seen the American movie Let Me In? Uh, have you seen the original, Let the Right One In? Right? It's no contest, right? Which one's better? Anyway, whatever. Uh, so let's come, uh, let's come to check out Breathless by uh, Jean Luc Godard. I hope it hadn't already begun. Oh, good. All right. So let me stop this screen recording now. That again, right away you know whether that's for you or not, right? Right away you are, as the notes suggest, let's flip back to those just real quick. Uh, yeah, come on to the catch up with us. Oh, wait, it's never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I'm foolish. Uh, as we come back to the notes, right? We, we can totally see that spontaneous disconnection from anything like linear flowing storytelling. That the perfect manner composition stuff that's up a little higher here that they kind of voted against, right? You see it's totally gone out the window. That there's no flowing linear storytelling. That you are always kind of held at distance from the movie, you're totally aware you're watching a movie the whole time, you're watching this, right? That's, that's what I call it, kind of this anti-suture that keeps us out of the film. We can see the easiest example of that are all these jump cuts, right, that are illogical, right? That he goes, ooh, la, la, some girls hitchhiking, and the camera pans back to him, then there's a jump in an edit, there's just an edit that happens, that then when he pans back, it's totally different girls, but the dialogue sounds as if it's continuous. Ooh, I'll, uh, pay, I'll ask him for a kiss a mile, or whatever he says, right? That it's discontinuous, that he moves to put past one car, and in passing one car, we see him air, air, past four cars. In that instance, no attempt to weave you into the story and present a, blow, a flowing, linear thing. That is classical Hollywood cinema. Classical Hollywood cinema, where am I in that photo? What classical Hollywood cinema hides all of that art, he's interested in foregrounding it, right? but in a much different way than Orson Welles was doing, right? That Orson Welles was doing it in a grand artistic way. Here, it's disruptive. Here, it alienates us or distances us from the film. And so, you know, all you have to really do is to contrast that with the ways in which uh, his, films, uh, his film operates. We'll, we'll have time to check out another clip, so hold steady for a bit, right? So jump cut, as an elliptical edit, I haven't seen the answer for that thing to come across uh, come across the Twitter feed just yet, uh, but someone asked, what are, what is, uh, what exactly is a jump cut? And if we leave out the word exactly and just ask what is that, someone could probably tweet that relatively quickly here so we all have those minutes, right? And so for these guys, what you can, and I'm going to come back to more uh, breathless in just a moment, but you can see one of the things that these guys are totally after here is the way in which uh, we should have used film as an expression. Right? That the camera and its edits and sound, right? You heard that when he, the Doppler effect, right? When he honked the horn, apparently he, and he goes, as the car goes by, right? That sound changes shape as space, as you move, right? Sound echoes, or waves rather, change shape as you move. That's the Doppler effect. That he records it, and it's almost dis as disruptive as that style of editing. And indeed, for these guys, they promoted this idea that film should be a personal expression of the filmmaker. So whether it's in Truffaut's mode, in which he uh, works in, um, in autobiographical stuff into his film, his films are not about him, but he works autobiographical stuff into that, for Godard, his personal signatory style is one that's going to foreground filmmaking over and over again, right? That you're going to see and recognize that, you're just, uh, that, you are, uh, uh, that you are watching a film. And in such, one of the things that ends up coming out of this is that they are almost, in some real way, always about film themselves. 
Now, Breathless, or Neither Breathless Nor 400 Blows, deals with making a film, but in a real way, by foregrounding the artist's art of film, by foregrounding edits and sounds and all of those things that Hollywood works to su su uh, suppress so much, the Hollywood cinema, uh, excuse me, the, uh, Jean-Luc Godard is really, in a sense, making a commentary about film itself. That although the dominant style hides itself very well in favor of the film story, audience, don't forget that you are always being manipulated by something that is entirely constructed. That Hollywood has worked to hide its construction very, very much in favor of the film story. And Godard, by foregrounding it, editing and sound, most exemplified here, and we'll see in a moment, duration, but by foregrounding that stuff, he's just showing you what goes on in every single movie. That's all he's doing. And while you go, oh, look at that, sloppy, or oh, that's disruptive, or whatever, that he's showing you the stuff that no one else, right? Everyone else, the dominant mode, is the Wizard of Oz. You don't see the Oz, the, uh, the wizard, behind the curtain, pulling all of the strings. He shows you these strings. So let's check out the end of the movie. So, uh, so stop recording. <laughs>